Hi, welcome to our lockdown study of Malachi. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Carol Beakley and I am a missionary from Bethany. Um, been in South Africa for about a little over 18 years. Um, I'm married to David Beakley, um, who um, we've been married for almost 40 years now, 38 years. Um, I have four kids and I have four grandchildren with one on the way. So I've lived um, a fair amount of life <laughs> to see a lot of different things. But I want to thank you for doing the study with me. I've been um, uh, in lockdown and so this is sort of fun for me to get an opportunity to jump into the Word and study and I've been enjoying that. Um, I hope you will enjoy and have already enjoyed your week of study so far. And um, I just want to know that I look forward to discussing with you on Tuesday um, our discussion of what you found and what you discovered in Malachi 1. But I thought to help with the discussion, because Zoom isn't that great, that um, I'd go ahead and videotape just a quick lesson of going through Malachi 1. And then... Um, uh, we can discuss it on Tuesday. So I'm hoping you've already done your homework because uh, I, I think it's just best to always find things out on your own before the Lord um, without someone else telling you things. But let's just begin with prayer and start from there. Lord, I just want to thank you for this time. I thank you for these women that have set aside a little time in their weeks to um, just to study your word and to take you seriously. Father, I pray that you would help us to remember who you are, to remember how great your name is, and that you are the one that is worthy of all of our praise and all of our thoughts and all of our attention. Um, Lord, help us to um, make you first and and acknowledge who you are. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in Amos 8.11, it says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or thirst for water, but rather for the hearing of the words of the Lord. Malachi is written, um, it's the last book of the Old Testament, um, there, after Malachi, there's 400 years of silence from God. He didn't send a prophet or anything until Christ came. So um, there was a famine of God's word for 400 years because you didn't hear his voice. So um, I think it's worthy of us to study right now. And I know in light of thinking of end times and this lockdown makes us think of those things. Um, I just think that... We can go into Malachi and take a look at what was the last thing that the Lord said to him, and why, and what was he trying to prepare them for. Well, um, when I, uh, oh, I thought of, there's this video clip that's on the internet that you probably have seen before, and I just thought it was really funny. Um, it's a woman who's talking to herself. Uh, like a January 2020 woman talking to herself in April 2020. And it's very interesting because the April 2020 person is saying, you know, uh, why don't you sell all your stocks and um, why don't you um, uh, get, a, get a hobby? <laughs> and teases her about she's not going to be traveling and various things and it's just very funny. And I thought, you know, so much of life we're told ahead of time by God, and we don't take it seriously. And just like that woman who, if she would have listened to herself um, four months later, we would have done things differently in January had we known what was going to happen by April. Um, I'm still in lockdown. It's almost two months now. So... Um, Let's look at, I think the, a good way to start when we study a book is to look at the historical context. Hopefully you've done some of that yourself, um, but let me just, just highlight some of the key things. Um, 
In 586, they went into captivity, Israel did, just as Moses told them that would happen if they disobeyed the Lord and, and didn't take him first. And, and he was very patient with them to let them get to that point. But they finally did go into captivity, and Isaiah and Jeremiah warned them, but they um, wouldn't heed their warnings. And so they went into um, captivity in Babylon. And Jeremiah prophesied that they would be there 70 years, but then they would come out. Um, and it happened exactly as God said. Even Isaiah prophesied 175 years before that there would be a, a person named Cyrus that was going to come and let them out and return to Jerusalem. So they've had no excuse. They've been given prophecy and warning after warning and also seeing God's faithfulness that he has kept with them and stayed with them this whole entire time. God has been faithful. He's been patient with them. Um, it, it, he's proven that he is the one to worry about, not kings or rulers or anything, powers or government, which is a good reminder for us, right? That we don't have to worry about even the coronavirus or anything like that or government or what they're going to do because God is in control and he can change the world just like that. Well, but the big question is how have they treated this faithful, patient, good God in their life? So um, what happened after they returned to the land and, um, and then the, up to the time of Malachi? After they returned, just as God promised, they started rebuilding their house. And they started um, building their um, properties and their farms and various things. And they started to build the temple, but they had some money problems. They had um, opposition from, from local people. And so they decided, you know, let's, let's stop. Let's just go back to building our house. And they did. Then Ezra came and preached to them from the Word of God, um, and they started to, okay, you're right, let's rebuild the temple again, but then they had again opposition, so they went back to rebuilding their houses, until finally Haggai came, and um, he, that's a great book, which I recommend reading, but he really um, said they need to stop and consider their ways that they had been building panels in their houses. I mean, a paneled house means wood paneling on the sides. Not only do they have a house, not only do they have property and farms, but they have enough money to even wood panel the insides and fix up the insides. And he says, what are you doing? You still haven't finished the temple. And so they went back and they finally refinished the temple. Um, but then the walls of the city were broken down and not taken care of. And so Nehemiah comes back and leads the people, um, which, by the way, was also prophesied in Daniel. Daniel said that uh, this was going to happen. But Nehemiah came back and they built, rebuilt the walls of the, temp, of the city. And he did it in 52 days, which is amazing. And there was a lot of opposition and a lot of challenges. But God faithfully protected them and got them through, and they walked by faith, and God honored that, and they rebuilt the um, walls. Well, while Nehemiah was there, um, they again, Ezra preached, and they recommitted themselves to the Lord. Um, by the way, to really understand Malachi, you need to read the book of Nehemiah, which we'll be doing, um, we'll be doing some study specifically chapter 13 next week, but we'll get to that. Um, but let me just tell you this, that in Nehemiah 10, they promised that they would not give their daughters to any local people or their sons allow them to marry any of the local people. And they promised not to buy from anyone on the holy day, that that would be remain sacred and set apart for the Lord. They would let their crops rest for every seven years, um, which is why they went into captivity, um, and that they would not neglect the house of the Lord. Uh, but that didn't last very long. Um, anyway, they promised this and made a covenant and um, before God, and Nehemiah went back to serve Artaxerxes. 
but they grew tired of waiting for the Messiah and they things weren't happening the way they wanted them to and they weren't becoming as wealthy and ruling as they uh, were promised and they were looking forward to that day so in their mind they felt like um, God wasn't delivering what he promised and they became ap apathetic towards God um, and they went back to their selfish lives apart from God and may we not do that. Um, sometimes that's what we do, isn't it? As we become apathetic towards God and just go back to how can we fix our lives to make it more comfortable. But 12 years later, Nehemiah comes back and he came back to sort them out again. And that's the backdrop of Malachi, um, Nehemiah 13. So next week we'll study Nehemiah 13 before we go into chapter 2. So you can understand exactly what was going on and what Nehemiah found when he came back 12 years later. So let's open the book of Malachi. That was the history. Um, and we're going to walk through just chapter 1 um, of Malachi. Uh, I think you might find it funny. In Africa, we call it Malachi. Um, but uh, anyway, Malachi 1. And um, I just want you to... Uh, Open up your own Bibles and let's read together and we're going to stop often and just take a look at what we have and we're sort of going to go verse by verse and take a look at it and then we'll um, think through the application of how we want to apply it to our lives. Verse number one says the oracle or the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi, my messenger. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Well, I love how God begins this. God says, he's reminding them, he goes, I have loved you. I have in the past loved you. I have in the future loved you. I have always loved you. Um, he's been faithful. He's been patient with them. And that's what verses 1 through 5 is really all about, is that God is saying, I've loved you and I've been patient with you. Um, but they ask the question, how have you loved us? You know, the God, I thought if you loved me, you would give me what I want. And, you know, we do that too, don't we? We so often say, God, you don't love me because you're not giving me the marriage I want or the children that are obedient that I want or the house that I want or the, the lifestyle or the job or or." the tile or the windows or whatever drapes you want. Um, we're always saying things to God, aren't we? And testing him just like them. But God says um, that he loves them. And they said, how have you loved me? Loved us. And it, let me read on in verse 2. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. And I have made this mountain a desolation and appointed it as his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Though Edom says, we have, be we have been beaten down, but we will return and rebuild our the ruins. Thus the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will tear down. Men will call them wicked territory and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. But why would he use this example as how he has loved them? Well, hopefully you did a little bit of study in that, and maybe you had some history of understanding it, but Esau was Jacob's brother. Um, Esau was the firstborn, so Esau really should have had the birthright, um, and that means the birthright that was promised from Abraham was uh, that, that they were going to carry a seed, and that, that um, in that seed, all the nations of the world would be blessed through that seed, which we know now as Christ. So Esau was, was assumed he was going to get that birthright. But Esau, um, which is called Edom there, we did a little bit of, if you did your homework, you saw that what he did is he was out hunting one day and he came back and he was hungry and he saw this red stew that um, Jacob had and he said, oh, let me have some of that stew. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright. And Esau said, sure, you can have it. It doesn't matter to me at all. I want that stew. 
he sold the idea in his mind that he could have had the seed of Christ, he sold it for a, a bowl of stew. That shows you how lightly he thought of Christ. And boy, anyone that takes God's son lightly um, is going to be in trouble with the Lord. So God says, I've hated him. And he says that um, that they will not succeed. And even though Edom will stand up and um, say, ah, oh, you know, we can rebuild, but that's just pride. And God says, and it never happens and it never will. And he says, for your eyes, um, verse five, and your eyes will see this and you will say, the Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. You will see that I have always loved you and I have never left you and always been faithful. And they were not. But he was. He's always been faithful. So in light of, if we had to get the big picture of what's going on here, God is saying, I have loved you. I have been faithful and patient and kind to you. But Israel is... is how are they treating this God that has loved them and chosen them and been kind to them? And in now from verses chapter 1, verse 6, all the way to 2.17, we're going to find how has Israel responded to this God that has loved them and been kind to them. Verse 6, a son honors his father and a servant his master, that if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I'm a master, where's my respect, says the Lord of hosts, to you, O priest, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? So God saying, hey, if I'm, a, if I'm a father, honor me. If I'm a master, show me respect. And, and they haven't done it. Um, and they said, they, and God accuses them of despising him. And they said, how have we despised you? Well, you're presenting defiled food for my altar. And you say, how have we defiled you? And that you, you say, the table of the Lord is to be despised. But when, the present, um, but when you present the blind for sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you present the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? Would he receive you kindly? Says the Lord of hosts. So they're giving God um, worthless things, things that don't matter to them, things that have no value, um, that are like garbage. It's like, okay, I'll, I'll give that to God. But I, anything that's a value, I'm keeping it for myself. I'm not going to share with God, and I'm not going to give anything to God. So anything valuable is not going to the Lord. Um, and yet, it's funny if they said it, but if your governors wanted something, you would give them your best. Now, in our case, think of this. If, if the governor of, of your state or if um, the president came to your home, would you not spend all the money and all whatever you need to get the table done nicely and, the, um, and, and, and sacrifice your time and your effort to try to really honor them? Um, and yet, at the same time, we won't do that to God or to his servants. That's what, the, that's what God's saying. Verse 9, But now will you, will you not entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to you with such an offering on your part? Will he receive you kindly, says the Lord? It's like they want God's favor, but they treat him as worthless. And again, we have the same problem, don't we? We want God's favor. We want um, any goodness he's going to give us. And yet we don't treat him with honor and respect. Oh, that there were someone among you who would shut the gates that you might not usefully, uh, uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts. No, nor will I accept an offering from you. Would you shut the gates? That means he's saying, would you, oh, that somebody would stop this lack of honor on my Sabbath, that they would shut the gates, that they wouldn't allow 
um, the foreigners to be selling and doing business on the Sabbath day and that they wouldn't be taking these um, offerings as a as a something light and, and not of value. Verse 11, For from the rising of the sun, even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense is going to be offered to my name, and a grain offering that is pure for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. He's telling them, my name's going to be great. <laughs> you want to be on my side, not on somebody else's side. Um, then verse 12, but you are profaning, profaning my name. You're profaning it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled. And as for its fruits, its food is to be despised. Its food is like garbage. You also say how tiresome it is. And you disdainfully sniff at it, as says the Lord of hosts. And you bring what is taken by robbery and what is lame and, or sick. So you bring the offering. Should I receive that from your hands, says the Lord? The, law for, the uh, Lord's offering is tiresome. It feels like a tax to them. It's like, you know, like taxes, you're always trying to figure out a way to give them less if possible. Um, they don't want to give what's theirs to God. Um, sort of how we respond to many times the government, right? We don't want to give what's ours to the government. So we try to hold back and we're like, ah, oh, taxes again. Well, that's how they're responding to God, like it's taxes, like it's not an opportunity to give to the Lord. It's actually taxes. It's a pain. It's a, um, an inconvenience. Um, and so um, that is a, that's their problem with the, how tiresome it is. And then in verse 14, it says, But cursed be the swindler who has a male in his flock and vows it, but sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. Um, for I am, the, I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Cursed is the swindler. The swindler is like Ananias and Sapphira. Um, in Acts 5, they, um, they told everyone they had this property and they sold it and they want to give it all to the Lord. But the reality is that um, they only gave a partial portion of it. And um, so they were a hypocrite to the people. And then they also were lying to God because they were implying to God, I'll give you it all, but they didn't give it all. So they made an oath and they said, I'm going to give the Lord this great sacrifice. But the reality is that they were actually stealing, stealing from the Lord in that they promised. Um, better, and I just think of the passage, it says better not to make an oath at all. We really should be very careful what we say we'll do to, for the Lord um, because he will hold us to it, and rightly so. Because he will do everything he says, and he expects us to do the same. So sometimes it's better not to make an oath and just say that. And that's why I often use the word, Lord willing. Lord willing, I'll do that. Lord willing, I'll do that. Because I sometimes I don't get to it, and I, and I I'm, plan on it, but I don't. God takes our our um, statements literally well that's briefly um, Malachi and and the big idea here is to um, he ends it for I am a great king says the Lord of hosts and my name is to be feared among the nations fear God for he's a great king and Lord of hosts you know we've been reading that Lord of hosts all the way through the whole book that Lord of hosts means Lord of many armies um, why would you mess with him? And sometimes we forget that, right? He's the Lord of hosts. Why would we mess with him? So let's take a look, and that's chapter one, and we've got a lot more to study, but let's just take a look at our application of um, chapter one. You know, it started off with God saying, um, I've loved you. Um, have you ever said or thought, does God really love me? Um, questioned or tested God that way? I know I have. Um, and I, I look back on it and I know that it was times that I'm saying, God, why aren't you giving me in my life what I want? Or why aren't you 
giving justice and fixing things to make it right the way I think it should be made. Um, that's not a time to be questioning God's love. Love is an interesting thing and it's worth studying, but it's in this, it, in Malachi, you see very clearly, it's not, it's not a feeling, it's a truth, it's a fact. He starts off the book with saying, I have loved you. It's, it's just a statement, God saying, this is truth. You know, when I was um, dating my husband years ago, he said, Carol, I love you. And I remember going, yeah, right. <laughs> I don't believe you. I don't trust you. I don't know. A lot of people have said those words to me and they don't have much meaning to me. Um, but we've been married now 38 years plus, And he has stuck with me through thick and thin, through me being very difficult to live with sometimes. Um, and you know, when I'm thrown up over a toilet, he holds my hair and, you know, just he's walked through a lot of tough things with me. And you know what I can say? He truly does love me because he's proven it. Over time, he's shown me and shown me and shown me over and over and over again um, of how he has loved me. The facts have proven that he did, that he did then and he does now. Um, what has God done that has proven himself and his love over and over and over again? God says he loves us, and yet what has he done? Well, one, he gave us his son, and he paid for all my sins, all my times that I have been rebellious of him and given him a hard time um, and, and fought him. Uh, even though I knew what he was saying was right, I went my way. Well, Ephesians 1 is a great place to go. Um, if you ever have this question of, of God, do you really love me? Ephesians 1 is a great place to go. And then just go through that. And I'm just going to pull up a couple things that I picked out of that, that he chose me, um, that comes out of Romans 1. He chose to open my eyes. I didn't choose. I don't know about your testimony, but I wasn't looking for God. But God chose me. He, he opened my eyes. And he adopted me into his family. That's just an amazing thought, that I can be part of God's family. And God, the creator of the universe, and Jesus, the Lord of hosts, that's an amazing thing that he adopted me into that family. And who, me? Nothing. I'm nobody. I'm just this old lady that lives in Africa. And yet God chose me and he adopted me. And then on top of all that, as I said before, he paid for all my sins that I wasn't even able to pay. If I spent every waking moment for the rest of my life trying to repay for all the things that I've done wrong, I wouldn't even come close. But he paid for it. He promises to raise me from the dead, which I don't even understand, but that gives me such hope that I'm not even scared with the coronavirus. And he's given me, it says already, in the past, I have an inheritance waiting for me. I, but why do I have an inheritance? I'm nobody. And yet I'm adopted into his family and I'm giving his inheritance. And he's also given me the Holy Spirit Right now, I have the Holy Spirit within me. Now, I don't know about you, but it's not like I have a dot on my forehead or, or a tingly feeling. I don't trust any of those. But if you study on the Holy Spirit, you find that the Holy Spirit's there to convict us and to guide us and to remind us of the truth. And that's so wonderful when a, when a verse comes to mind or when a um, song comes to mind about the Lord, that he reminds us how faithful and patient and kind he is to us. Um, he's also given us wisdom and knowledge of him that I had no idea until he opened my eyes to be able to understand his word. 
And he offers for us to let us to know him even more if we study God's word, that he's there. And as we choose to obey him and follow him, he says that he'll even make himself known to us. It's an amazing thing. He's loved us. He's always loved us. We just selfishly sometimes want things of our own. The point is that he's been faithful. He's fulfilled every promise and he's been patient with me. He has proven he loves me. So the question remains just like it does for them. How have I treated him? Well, what do I give him? Do I give him my leftovers and my worthless offerings and sacrifices? Well, we don't sacrifice nowadays. We don't have an altar. But we do have money, and we do have time, and we do have energy. And often I find myself saying, oh, I don't want to do that for the church. That's just too much work. I, I want some time for me. Isn't that stealing from the Lord when he gives us an opportunity to serve? Think tithing to the Lord Sometimes I think it's tiresome. Um, it feels like a tax. It's like that I don't want to give the Lord what's mine. If I can keep that amount, then maybe I could get my windows done. <laughs> it's so silly. God says, give, give, and he'll give back. He is so wonderful on how much he gives us. And we need to just get our minds right on who he is and who we're giving to. And even every day when we, every Sunday, even in lockdown, are you tithing? Are you offering? And um, if you're like me, my husband usually does the bills, so I don't always see it go out. Um, and so I do some of that financially, but I do even more with, can I call somebody? Can I serve somehow? Even in lockdown, I can encourage people. We don't want to be like Ananias and Sapphira and promise to give God what is worthless and, and, and be a hypocrite um, and think you can lie to God. So let's be careful with that. So why do we think we can treat God lightly? I think um, sometimes that after all this that... Um, I feel like a failure and I feel faithless. Um, you know, sin, sin, the same thing of um, sin is unbelief. Anytime I choose to do what God's telling me not to do in sin, that I'm sinning, and I'm actually showing and proving I don't believe, I don't trust God, I don't trust in His goodness, I don't want to wait upon Him when he's going to and wait for whatever he's going to give to me. I find myself very faithless. I don't know about you, but I'm hoping this, this little verse will encourage you like uh, it did me this passage. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. It starts off with, it is a trustworthy statement. I love that. It's a trustworthy statement. You can trust it. Um, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure with him, we'll also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. And if we are faithless, remember I just said, I have trouble with faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot deny himself. He will still be faithful to keep his promises. So what's my advice after studying Malachi 1? Well, one, take time to ponder. Um, even today and, and before you get on to Malachi 2 and before you open your Bible, take time to think about how faithful God's been to you and his kindness. Um, if your hope is that you remain faithful, well, you know, find soon that is not going to happen but our hope my hope is an assured faith this is what i hold on to this is my rock is that he will remain faithful and that he will keep me until the end as he's promised 
don't grow tired of waiting for the Messiah and saying, you know, he says he's coming back, but I don't know, and becoming apathetic to God and say, ah, it doesn't really matter. I can do whatever I want and go back and just doing selfish things that are against God. Spend time with him every day, seeking him and seeking to see his kindness. It's all around you. It's, it's there every morning, every day. If you had to write a list, it would be bigger than, um, you know, that's the hymn that says that the oceans were ink and the, um, we would be, and the sky was the scroll. We would, it, we'd run out of space of all the things that he has given you in the last few minutes. So really focus on that and focus on his kindness because that's what will hold you when you um, doubt his faithfulness. It's when we're thinking about things in the lo this world and we're thinking about our own little kingdoms, our own little houses, our own little families of what we want and we get dissatisfied and discontent and then we go off trying to find it ourselves. Wait for the favor of the Lord and be looking for his kindness and realize he's giving you a lot and he's promised to give you even more. He will remain faithful to his promises. Praise the Lord. So Lord willing, I will see you Tuesday morning um, and discuss what you've discovered and how you've applied Malachi 1. Um, let me just pray right now as we end. Lord, I just want to pray that um, each one of us will grow in our knowledge of you, that um, you will give us eyes to see your kindness and a heart that will be convicted when we hear your scripture. Father, I pray that you would guide us so that we would honor you and be used to make your name great, make your name known. It is great. I just want to make your name known. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.